This is the Hockey Show. Roy Bellamy, David Druck in the Hockey News. This is our trade deadline show, ladies and gentlemen. David Pignotta is going to show up, and so will Darren Drager from TSN. Big guns. Big guns. Woo. We are going to guess what's going to happen during the trade deadline. This is the trade deadline show. The trade deadline show. But before we get to that, we're going to talk about the Florida Panthers, who won their 13th game out of 15. Man. And uh, it's a lot. It's a lot on paper when you look at it. Just a whole bunch of W's on your screen here and, and on the computer. So, uh, yeah. But they haven't played well really that recently. I mean, they've gone to overtime three times in, in the last five games. And last night especially, we saw – couple of blown coverages that led the breakaways one goal and that face-off goal I mean they had four Panthers spotted up in front of the crease I don't know how Stolarz was able to see that puck yeah I mean, and Paul Maurice even said after the game that the, the first couple of goals that they scored were a little tight untraditional yeah. um, but I think just to your point Roy that's what makes this Panthers team so unique compared to past years and even other teams when they don't have their A game, they're still able to find a way to get that dub and to get the two points. They scratch and claw, whether it's relying on their goaltending, relying on the ridiculous talent pool that they've got. So uh, this is a pretty stacked team right now, even when they're not at their best. And the special teams last night, the uh, penalty kill, even though uh, Sam Reinhardt scored a short-handed goal, not that great. Well, I, I think that it was Paul Maurice was talking about after the game. You're dealing with a very young, fast, skilled team in Montreal that's really got nothing to lose right now. And Florida, you know, for what it's worth, they've got a lot riding on every game. They've got a lot going on. They're focusing on the playoffs, so perhaps a little tight at times. But special teams are going to be clutch for this team just because we've seen throughout the year that it's carried them, especially lately with the power play and the, and the uh, penalty kill. So, yeah, it's the kind of thing that these are the games that you want to kind of work out those kinks. Sam Reinhardt also scored a power play goal. That's number 40 and 41 on the season. Man, Sam Reinhardt. That guy's going to get paid, huh? Yeah. That, that might be something we want to ask these insiders about. Yeah. There might be a bit of a sacrifice for the Panthers here so that they can actually pay Sam Reinhardt. Well, that's going to be the big question, isn't it? Are they going to be able to pay the Reinhardts, the Forslings, the Montours, everybody that's going to be UFA after this year? They're going to have some decisions to make, so we'll see uh, if they can get everything done. Because I know there is a plan for Bill Zito, the Panthers GM, to get everything done. We'll see if everybody cooperates. And as I said, today is the trade deadline show, and from the fourth period, we have David Pignota. We are going to talk a little bit of trade deadline, but first, I want to talk about the Los Angeles Kings. You're over there on the West Coast. Uh, they're currently tied for a wild card spot. Do you think they're going to be buyers or sellers? Honestly, it, it, it's going to come down to the the overall future or fate, immediate future of Adrian Kempe and his health. If he's done for the regular season, and there's a strong belief that that's that could be the case, um, then they're going to engage. Now, some people think he could come back at the end of the month. If that is the case, if that's the diagnosis, then cap space, bye-bye. They have none. Uh, but if he is out until middle of April to the end of the month, then they're going to utilize that full cap space, the $5.5 million that is Kempe's hit in order to add. They've already asked about guys like Tyler Toffoli and Max Pacioretty and a few other players out there to try to get a gauge of, of you know what, what the marketplace is, what the price tag is like for some of these guys. Um, but again, really everything or anything that they do for now is dependent on Adrian Kempe's health. If he comes back in the March, forget about it. If it's prolonged, it's going to give Rob Blake some wiggle room. What about Quentin Byfield? Uh, it seems like he has a lot of potential. He is the highest yeah. black draft pick in NHL history, and he's having a fine season. What do you think about his career right now? Oh, it, it's just starting to climb. Like this is he's, he's not even scratched the surface of his potential yet. Um, and he's a versatile player. He was drafted as a center. He's playing the wing right now. Um, he can play in different situations. He's really, actually, in the last four games, really propped up Pierre-Luc Dubois' performance as well um, since, since they were kind of put on the line together. This guy is going to be a, an elite star in the National Hockey League. It's just going to take – some guys take, take a little bit of extra time, and with the depth that L.A. has, he doesn't have to be forced into situations to be the main guy right now at, at this young age. He, he's going to be a very good player um, for a number of years and I think will eventually evolve if he, if he isn't starting to already into a fan favorite in, in L.A. They, they went in the right direction with him and they slow cooked it. They didn't want to rush him. Um, and, and it's certainly paying off right now and it will continue to. And Ozzy Kopitar has, including this year, three years left on his contract. Does he have yeah. enough left on the tank or do you see him playing out the rest of his career on that contract? 
Uh, he's going to kind of see where it goes. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if this is his last overall deal. Um, maybe depending on where they're at, maybe he sticks around for another a year or, or whatnot. But, you know, when, when the sun kind of settles on, on his playing career, he'll eventually go back to Slovenia for the most part. Um, probably still have a place in LA, but, but go back to Slovenia with, with the wife and kids and, um, just live basically like a King out there. He's, he's a huge celebrity in, in his own country. Um, as well as obviously in LA. So, uh, look, he's, he's having a great year. He had some, you know, a little, I guess maybe around all-star right before he dipped a little bit. Um, and maybe some people were questioning his longevity, but he's kind of re upped that in the last little bit, really the entire team kind of reinvigorated, um, recently and, and a nice five, one victory the other night over Vancouver, um, should, should add a little bit of extra confidence, not just to him, but the rest of that roster. Dave, I want to switch gears to the Eastern Conference now. Uh, a, a couple of the top teams in the East that are possibly cup contending could be active at the deadline. Not so sure. Curious your take on both the Carolina Hurricanes over in the Metropolitan and the Boston Bruins in the Atlantic. Well, Carolina right now is looking to add up front. Um, there's the, the, they were part of the goalie discussions, but with Freddie Anderson set to come back, they, they actually have to figure out what they want to do there because they're going to end up with four goalies. Um, active once Freddie does come back and he's been skating for the last few weeks um, should be ready to go I, I, by the sounds of things sometime next week if not a little bit sooner um, but they want to add up front they want to add an extra little bit of scoring punch to that lineup and kind of deepen their their offensive abilities and and um, if they can do that and there was some talk that they were making a little bit of progress on that so maybe we get word you know later today or, or even tomorrow um, but the Hurricanes would like to certainly add to the offensive uh, side of the game. And I think from Boston's perspective, they're looking at every option. They're looking at defense. They've kicked the tires on guys like Sean Walker and Matt Dumba. If the prices drop a little bit, then I think they engage a little bit further on that. Otherwise, um, or in addition to that, I should say, center position. Um, they'd like to add, add up front as well. Center position still a primary to, to further deepen themselves up the middle. Alex Wenberg, I think, is a guy on their radar out of Seattle. I did also want to ask you about the Florida Panthers. We've heard them mentioned uh, with the likes of Noah Hannafin. We've heard them mentioned more recently mm -hmm. with uh, Vladimir Tarasenko. Now, I've heard that Tarasenko is interested in coming to Florida. I'm not sure that there's mutual interest yeah. there. I wanted to get your take on that. Yeah, I, I think he I, I think he would. I think that's, that's a destination. And, and, and my understanding is he is willing to move to a contender. Um, he's relayed that message to the Ottawa Senators. It's just a matter now of Steve Sales, their GM, kind of figuring out uh, what the best deal is. But he would be interested in going to Florida. You're right. I don't know if the feeling is fully mutual. Now, if the price drops and it's like a fifth-round pick and Ottawa eats half of his $5 million contract, then I think Bill Zito reconsiders yeah. um, that direction. Uh, but barring something like that, I think there are other teams. I think Carolina, who tried to sign him this summer, would be in on him. I think Vegas is in on him. A few other teams. But Tarasenko is going to have options, but he is willing to go to a contender. It's just a matter of the Sens now finding the right fit. The bottom three teams are Anaheim, San Jose, and Chicago. Obviously, Chicago is probably not going to do anything for this deadline. But what yeah. do you see Anaheim doing at the trade deadline? Frank Petrano is out there. Adam Henrique is out there. Sam Carrick is out there. Teams are calling about some of their other players as well. Now, Vitrano has one year left on his contract. The Rangers would love to make that reunion happen again and bring him back to the Big Apple. So they're having conversations there. Adam Henrique is being discussed across the board. Um, he just had his, his uh, I guess him and his wife had their second child at the start of the week. And the Ducks were waiting to see, I mean, when that would happen. Um, and talks have kind of picked up since now that uh, they welcome their second daughter. So um, we'll see kind of how that progresses, but I'm expecting, at, and Adam is too, that he is going to get traded ahead of the deadline, just a matter of when, not if. Vetrano, because of that extra year, they don't have to do it, but if you know the Rangers, for example, pay a bit of a premium, a premium then I think they would, um, would certainly bite on that. John Gibson is still available, but I, I think that might be more of a summer thing if it does happen. Um, and we'll see who else can kind of get plucked out of there. Jakob Silverberg, unless Anaheim retains half of that contract, probably going to be sticking around. He's a UFA at the end of the year as well. Dave, with the Edmonton Oilers, they've been a lot of fun to keep track of this year, obviously. It looks like they're mm -hmm. going to be a playoff team. Uh, it sounds like that they want to be pretty active at the deadline and kind of load up for a playoff run. What do you see them doing, yeah. and uh, do you see them kind of making that run? I do. Um, they, if, they, if they make these ads, um, they want to add a defenseman. They want to add 
a mid six forward. Um, somebody that can slot in the interchangeable second, third unit, depending on, you know, situational play and, and playoff matchups and things like that. So Pavel Busnevich out of St. Louis has got another year in his contract. They're very much engaged in that. I think Carolina, again, another team that we just talked about looking for forwards. I think they're in that mix. Vegas as well. Um, he's got a pricey tag to him. I mean, it's you're basically looking at two first-round picks plus to get Bushnevich out of St. Louis or a first plus an equivalent level prospect. Um, but Edmonton's right in the thick of things. They also want a defenseman. And for them, if they make any additions that are impactful, they're going to have to move bodies out. They're right up against the cap. So any anything that comes in, even if there is salary retention, it's going to require somebody moving out, whether it's Cody Cece or Brett Kulak on defense or Warren Fogle up front. All three of those guys, and I believe they know that they could be casualties of the cap situation in, in Edmonton. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see something kind of happen there. In fact, I believe um, – actually, I'll put this out here before I report it elsewhere um, – they have an offer on the table for one of the, the top defensemen that are available right now. It's a first-round pick and Cody Ceci. Oof. I don't know if it gets to the finish line, um, but that's something that's currently on the table for one of the defensemen that are out there. Finally, the Ottawa Senators, probably one of the biggest disappointments of the season, mm -hmm. second to last in the conference. Yeah. Do you see them selling off maybe a Jacob Chikrin? Oof. Well, uh, he's available. Um, you know, they, they – They've been telling everyone they're not shopping him, um, but they're also saying, all right, well, give us your best offer. Or let's talk more about this. So semantics, really. Um, but, you know, teams have called about him. They've called about Josh Norris, who just got hurt and his season might be over. Um, so a lot of teams, when you're at the bottom, they like to vulture in and see where they can get, um, you know, some deals or, or force somebody to potentially, you know, make a panic move. I, I think unless something steps up for Chikrin, I, I think this is a discussion that happens in the offseason closer to the draft. Um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if something happens around that in June in, in Vegas. But, you know, barring that, I, I, we talked about Tarasenko. Dominic Kubelik's going to be moved. That's their goal anyway, um, that, that he gets moved out as well for basically a mid-round pick. Um, and then outside of those two guys, they're, they're again, they're open to, to hockey moves, um, whether it's Chikrin or another people, some, some players before Riley Gregg slapped that puck right into that open cage in Toronto. <laughs> um, teams were calling about him too. Uh, so everyone's just kind of looking around and just making inquiries to see what's there. But I, I think Ottawa, if they can, would like to be active. And, and they're utilizing this deadline as basically a speeding up process for their offseason movement. So if they can make moves now and then follow that up at the draft, go into free agency, add to this group, I, I think that's the objective, uh, especially with this deadline for the Sens. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how they, they kind of play this one off. But um, if they do something fairly bold, whether it's Chikrin or somebody else, don't be shocked. From the fourth period, David Pinota, thank you for joining us. On TSN in Canada, there are two days that everybody looks forward for, uh, to. It's the trade deadline show and the free agent show. We are looking forward to the trade deadline show. That's Trade Center on TSN. That's going to be next week on Friday, March 8th, starting at 8 a.m., they're going to have, like, 35 people on the panel. On this. <laughs> it's going to look like an Earth, Wind & Fire concert, really. So many people are going to be on the stage. And one of those people is Darren Drager. Darren Drager is going to join us to talk uh, trade deadline right now. And we're going to start off with the two trades that have happened already. We're going to start off with Chris Tanev. Can you explain what happened in that trade? Well, it was an interesting trade. I mean, obviously, Chris Tanev is a right-shot defenseman. was one of the most coveted available defensemen. Um, and the Dallas Stars identified that Tanoff was going to be uh, a near-perfect fit. But there were other clubs that were keenly interested, the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Vancouver Canucks, the Colorado Avalanche to a degree, the Edmonton Oilers. And, you know, there are some who are critical of Craig Conroy and the Calgary Flames because they feel like maybe he jumped a little bit early. But they got a package that they were looking for, including a prospect defenseman who is tracking to be a real good defensive defenseman in the National Hockey League. So that's the tricky balance, guys, uh, between now and the March 8th trade deadline, is knowing when to pull the trigger. And the TANF deal, I think, uh, more or less kind of restarts the, the trading platform, if you will. And obviously that carried into Ilya Labushkin going from the Anaheim Ducks to the Toronto Maple Leafs with the Carolina Hurricanes involved as a broker. So when you uh, first begin with Tanif and the Calgary Flames, I think Calgary did well. 
Uh, I look at the New Jersey Devils as being a broker on that deal, and I know the Dallas Stars are over the moon based on the fact that they add a real high-character individual. And the Lub- uh, Lubuskin uh, trade, yeah. can you explain that one? Yeah. Well, look, Brad Trilliving, the general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs, again, was, was in on Chris Tanoff, but I think he recognized fairly early in the week that it just wasn't going to work. The fit wasn't there from Calgary's standpoint. So when uh, when Trey Living knew that he was going to have to turn, he had been in constant communication with some of the other guys in play. I think of Danny Briere and Sean Walker. Um, I think Ilya Labushkin and Pat Verbeek in the Anaheim Ducks. There's a familiarity with Labushkin, a reliability. You know, he's a big, strong guy. Uh, played well with Morgan Riley when he was formerly with the Toronto Maple Leafs. So. The fact that they got the Carolina Hurricanes involved, the Anaheim Ducks retain 50%, Carolina re- retains 25%, and it only cost the Maple Leafs a third-round draft pick and a sixth-round draft pick, I think that's some pretty good work by Trilliving. And I also think that the door is still open for Trilliving and the Leafs to do something else, like add another mm. defenseman. But they shore up a position of need, and that was that right-shot defense. Darren, I want to ask you about another team in the Eastern Conference, and it's the New York Rangers. They've been on a hell of a streak lately. It looks like uh, Igor Shesterkin has reclaimed his Vezina form, and that's a team that's rolling. Do you think that they're going to make any moves? Just Because like I've heard things like they're going to be like in 94, where they were already so good, but they made different moves to yeah. get it ready for the playoffs. So do you see anything like that going down this year? I absolutely do. And you know, I think you can expand that list. Any of the teams that we would consider to be top contending teams, uh, I think that they're going to do everything within their power to try and uh, upgrade. So I I most definitely see Chris Drury and the New York Rangers adding something. Um, there's been a, a, at least a loose connection, I would say, to the Anaheim Ducks. Pat Verbeek has been scouting closely, you know, watching the New York Rangers, the Carolina Hurricanes, and, um, you know, I, I can see Carolina adding a piece, like maybe Vetrano, if there's a fit there. I can see the New York Rangers taking a hard look at Adam Henrique. Mm. I mean, this guy is a salt of the earth, experienced forward who just all around makes you better. So I can see the fit there. And I'm not suggesting that that would be the only target of Chris Drury in the New York Rangers. But there was some speculation a couple of weeks ago on the possibility of Capo Caco being in play. And I don't think that we can officially dismiss that. It just seems like a real long shot at this point because, man, Has he changed his game? He's turned around, you know, coming off an injury. uh, Maybe it took him a little bit longer to to get up to pace and get back up to to game speed and all of that. But he's been a real contributing uh, piece for the New York Rangers. But I still think that Drury is on the hunt. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a connection to the Ducks in some form. Anthony Duclair is his own agent. And I think, I believe he's shopping himself around. Do you believe that he's going to get dealt? Well, he's on the list, Um, you know, so I I, I can't dismiss that possibility. I'm always careful in putting too much stock in the list of uh, trade bait players that all of us produce on a daily basis. But, I mean, we put those names on those graphics because they're legit. Those are players in play. I can can appreciate why Anthony DeClaire would be in play. You know, he's a very quick forward. He's got the experience. He certainly has uh, the resume. Does it get a little trickier because he represents himself? Mm, Maybe. Um, But in today's world, unless you have true trade protection, which includes either the no trade clause or the no move clause, the agents are aren't as involved as they once were in in negotiating these trades unless you're looking at a, a type of extension. Uh, but when I think of Anthony DeClaire, I think of a depth forward who can also play up in the lineup. So I think that uh, there'll be some interest, and I'm sure that there is some interest in DeClaire. Now, one of the hottest teams in the West lately has been the Nashville Predators. And they're, let's say they're going to be a playoff team. They're right on the, like above the, the Mendoza line, and there's a bit of a gap there, as you know, in the Western Conference standings. Now, this is a team that's got picks. They've got cap space. Do you think Nashville is going to be making some moves and try to maybe make a little playoff run here? Well, I could see Nashville making some moves. Excuse me, just battling a, a bit of a cold here. Oh. Um, but making moves in the sense of, of trying to improve, uh, I feel like we should be past 
the speculation on UC Saros, even though people continue to talk about it. I can't envision, you know, the run that the Nashville Predators are trying to build on as we get in the late stages of the regular season here and uh, the playoffs right around the corner. And you st- you trade a star goaltender like that. Carrier's name has been out there. Uh, I think that that's a bit of a long shot now. But maybe, maybe Barry Trotz, the general manager of the Preds, um, has changed his thinking with the currency that he has to maybe bring in some reinforcements. So among the teams that we're watching closely, fellas, for the next week leading up to next Friday's trade deadline, the Nashville Predators, because there is a level of uncertainty. I, they've, they've kicked the switch here. They're, they're not looking to be in the selling mode, but given some of the assets that they have, perhaps they're, they're in a position where they can add to uh, kind of bolster what they already have with the playoffs in mind. The two teams that Steve Eisenman has affected the rosters, uh, Tampa and Detroit, are currently in a wild card spot. Uh, do you see them making any moves? Mm. Well, when I look at the Tampa Bay Lightning, uh, I I have all the time in the world for the management of Julian Breezeball, the GM of, of the Tampa Bay Lightning, mm. because he was recognized since he took over the position from Eisenman that – it's a real small window, that window of, of having an opportunity to compete for the Stanley Cup. And they've been very, very successful. But when you look at the roster of the Tampa Bay Lightning, I think that you can absolutely appreciate that this is a team that knows that that window is coming to a close here. So I'd be surprised if Tampa Bay isn't actively involved. Um, it looks like they want to add something to their defense. There's been open speculation about maybe connecting to uh, the Calgary Flames and Noah Hannafin. As of our reporting yesterday, the Flames don't have enough yet. That can change with a simple phone call uh, to encourage them to move Hannafin, who's playing his best hockey. But I could see Tampa Bay and the Boston Bruins, as an example, trying to to, uh, improve in that area. And then I think Steve Eisenman and the Detroit Red Wings are still feeling things out a little bit and trying to figure out where they are. Are they a playoff team? Are they a non-playoff team? Um, Eisman has been pretty creative and very active over the last number of years as, you know, the, the Red Wings come out of that long rebuilding process. So as much as he may want to give his guys a shot in the arm, it also has to be made. Decisions like this has to be made more so on the long term. What's the better fit for the Detroit Red Wings moving forward as opposed to helping on the short term in trying to lock down a playoff spot or stay in the mix? Now, out west, the big name that we've heard a lot lately is Elias Pettersson. Uh, yeah. Can you kind of give us an insight on what the latest is with him in Vancouver? Well, that's a developing story, and it is a big one in Vancouver and really around the National Hockey League. And this is crafty veteran management by Jim Rutherford, Patrick Calvin, and the Vancouver Canucks. Because last weekend, there was speculation that surfaced that you know Rutherford and the Vancouver Canucks were uh, actually uh, approaching teams and at least nibbling at the edges of the potential of trade with Pedersen, either between now and the deadline or probably more likely in the offseason. And I I think that that was purely with design to encourage the player to the negotiating table, which absolutely happened, so it worked. So the contract negotiations began on Tuesday night, continued into Wednesday, uh, yesterday, and I'm sure that they'll resume again today. It's a tricky one, right? Because... Elias Pettersson did not want to be a distraction. He didn't want to be disruptive, but now he's in a position where, you know, all of the speculation, everything that's hovering around the Vancouver Canucks has been exactly that. So why not engage? And that's where they're at now. Um, A player of that magnitude, you're looking at anywhere from a five-year contract extension to the maximum eight years. And when you look at the productivity of Elias Pettersson, uh, I look at the extension of William Nylander and the Toronto Maple Leafs. Mm. And that came in at an annual average salary of $11.5 million. Now, Pedersen is tracking a little bit higher than that, but you have that restricted free agent year. So it is complicated. Uh, and what will happen is Pat Brisson and J.P. Berry, who represent Elias Pedersen, will gather all of the options and the possibilities that they've discussed and negotiated with Canucks management, take them back to Pedersen and say, all right, which one is the best fit for you? Patterson will decide which one is the best fit for him. And if that jives with the Vancouver Canucks, then they get a deal done very quickly. Could it be two days? Sure. Could it be a couple of weeks or in the off season? Absolutely. Because, you know, it's fashionable now for players, again, 
of that level and that skill set to want a shorter term. So I'm sure the player is looking at a five-year option and the Vancouver Canucks are probably thinking, no, we'd prefer to get you on an eight-year yeah. extension. So of I think there's some work that lies ahead. And down here, we cover the Florida Panthers and yeah. they have people that they need to sign in the offseason. But for right now, looking at the trade deadline, what do you think Bill Zito has up his sleeve? Well, Billy Zito always has something up his sleeve. You know, he's he's one of the more aggressive general managers. But also, guys, you know this because you watch this team closely and they are so good. I mean, in so many different ways, they are considered the model of the Eastern Conference and maybe to a point across the National Hockey League based on how Paul Maurice has that team committed to playing. They play hard, but they can play any different way. So you got to be careful not to mess too much or tinker too much with the chemistry. Now, I think that the Florida Panthers would like to add a winger, maybe a depth center. But I don't think that Bill Zito is looking at the looming trade deadline through a position of need. You always have wants, but it's money in, money out for the Florida Panthers. They're a cap team. If there's an opportunity to add a depth forward, then I'm sure he will do that. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if he does that. But if there isn't an affordability or if there isn't a financial fit where he just, you know, he can't make it work, I don't think that the Florida Panthers are overly concerned or look at their roster and see holes. I don't believe that for a second. You can catch him on one of TSN's biggest shows of the year, his Trade Center, and it's next week, March 8th, starting at 8 a.m. Darren Drager, thank you for joining us. Hey, guys, thank you.